for the invitation to be here. I am here to represent Gulf Power Company. And as Ventina mentioned, we're a regional electric utility. We own our own generation transmission and distribution in Northwest Florida and part of the larger company, the Southern Company. Um, I tell you, we have a long history with education partnerships. A lot of companies do. I will say our definition of education partnerships has definitely changed over the years. We are no longer a write a check, put our name on the sign kind of partner. We are what I would now call an in the weeds kind of partner. And I love to live in the weeds of education. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the changes that we have seen in the energy industry. Our industry is definitely going through a transformation, how that impacts our workforce needs and the skills that are required by our existing workforce and the future workforce, and then what we're doing as a company and really as an industry to impact change in the education system to make sure that we have folks prepared for those changing workforce needs. Um, all of you, I'm assuming, are customers of the energy industry, yes? Um, okay, we are right now, certainly. Um, but thank you for your business. And um, we are thrilled that here in the United States of America, we pretty much have the luxury of taking that for granted. It is not the case in the world. Um, I talk to student groups all the time, and I help them understand if you line up 10 of you from around the world, four of you really have reliable electricity. What does that mean? What that means is you can wake up and not worry about, oh, is it going to work for me today? Am I going to have refrigerated food? Am I going to have what I need to be able to do my homework when I get home? Am I going to be able to play my games? Whatever it is they're focused on. Um, and so I will say that somewhat parallels what we as an industry have counted on from education because what we've needed traditionally has been there and we've been able to take for granted that the knowledge and the skills of the folks that we're looking to hire will be there for us. That's not the case anymore and many industries are undergoing such change that really for the first time in a very long time they're coming back with requests that cannot be met. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of those in um, the energy industry. We definitely have some game changers in our industry. You've all heard about smart grid. We call it smarter grid. It's always been smart. Um, but grid modernization is absolutely bringing about change in the workforce in the energy industry. As a specific example, like Lisa gave, um, you may know that previously at your home you had folks who read your meter. Some of us very creatively, like Tony said earlier, call them meter readers. Um, that position, or field service reps, that position as we're moving to digital metering as an industry is definitely changing. As you can imagine, the skills required to read a meter, physically read a meter, and enter information into a computer system, probably a computer in the truck or a handheld device, that is very different than the electronics skill sets that are required to maintain um, a meter that is read electronically now. Um, so when you just think about that simple example, there are many more. When you think about a smarter grid, the folks that actually operate the grid, there are transmission system operators. The skill sets that are required of them today are very different than they would have been previously. There's a significant new build going on within the energy industry. There are both new construction projects of um, generating plants including new nuclear being built for the first time in this country in 30 years, um, but also significant transmission line projects that are being constructed. All of that really requires a very heavy focus on both industrial construction skill sets as well as engineering skill sets that since in the southeast of the United States most of our construction of both power plants and the electric grid really took place about 30 years ago. We haven't had the demand. We absolutely have the demand now, and it's actually occurring at a time when other industries are requiring those exact same skills, like manufacturing, like rebuild efforts from hurricanes that are still underway. Um, also, of course, new technologies that are coming into the energy industry and many other industries. With all that said, though, I think it's very fair, and most folks in the energy industry would agree, 80% of what we're looking for today is what we've been looking for all along. 20% might be the application of those knowledge and skills has changed. There is a little bit of new knowledge. 
um, but it's the application of that common or consistently demanded knowledge and skills that is changing. Um, we find that with our existing workforce, so we have internal training requirements with these changes in our industry, but we really see it when we haven't changed programming at the secondary or post-secondary level to prepare future workers, and we're still delivering curriculum for, you know, our granddad's energy industry, and that's where we um, have some challenges. So impacts definitely are that we have this um, more heightened awareness of a continued increasing demand for industrial construction skill sets and skilled technician occupations, folks to be ready for those occupations. And that, I think we're starting to hear much more frequently now. Um, that is, in Florida, construction has always been interesting to me. When I think construction, I don't think residential. I think structural steel workers. I think industrial electricians. I think precision machinists. I don't think stick build construction, but I understand why commonly that's what's thought of as construction. The skill sets required in industrial construction to build our power plants, to be the contract labor force so that we only staff at the baseline minimal level that we need and then bring in extra folks throughout our industry in peak times or during outages in the fall and the spring. Those skill sets are very valued in the marketplace, not just by the energy industry, but many others. And we have significant shortages. We have the shortages for a couple of reasons. I'll tell you honestly, if you walk across a mechanical maintenance shop floor at one of our power plants and talk to welder mechanics and ask them, what are you raising your sons and daughters to do? Oh, they're going to college. Oh, I'm sorry, you must have misunderstood the question. What are you raising them to do? Not where are they going next, but the conversation in this country really has turned to a definition of success hooked on a path as opposed to the end game. And we've all fallen, I have, we've, we all fall prey to that conversation because it is what we value in our country. I have four sons at home. And I will tell you that before I got so heavily engaged in education, that's what I was talking to them about. Okay, what are we gonna do next? What do you do next? Really now we're focusing those dinner table conversations around what do you want to do with your life and then how do we help you today? Whether you're in elementary, and believe me I have them all over the level. I have an elementary, a middle, a high school, and an out of college. Um, all still deciding what they want to do with their lives. But what can we do today? <laughs> Although he's fully funding his existence in that decision making process, so we're okay. Um, but what, what can you do today? in the next phase of your education, whether that's middle school for you or post-secondary training or a quick response, maybe a workforce training opportunity, um, what can you do today to provide yourself with the education, training, knowledge, and experiences necessary to enter and advance in that future that you desire for yourself? And I think we really have to flip that conversation in this country. I was fortunate to be invited to Harvard earlier this year for their Pathways to Prosperity Conference. Their, their report is somewhat dated now. It was published at the very end of 2011. If you have not read the Pathways to Prosperity report published and jointly published by the Harvard School of Education and the Harvard School of Business, I would recommend that you read it. It does a great job of kind of framing up the challenges that our country and then consequently our industries and we as families are facing because of how the conversation really has geared our students toward this nebulous college not a specific degree as a path to a career, but nebulous college as the preferred next step in our country. I think it's something that we as industry and we as all partners in growing Florida's economy and preparing our youth, we have to focus in on the specifics so that our students can make more enlightened decisions about what they do next. And when they go to college or university, they're making, they're understanding that that's not the end game decision, that now you're there, you have to make a very clear decision about what you're going to do with your time at that institution. I think we also um, need to focus on bringing back value and pride to these occupations that we as a country, for lack of a better word, have poo-pooed for far too long now. Um, these skilled technician careers that really underpin the energy industry, advanced manufacturing, certainly industrial construction, aerospace and defense, homeland security, so many of our targeted industry clusters in the state of Florida, we have to bring value back to those careers. It can't be a, if you're not going to go to college, then maybe these would be your options. We have to raise awareness that the 
English language arts or technical reading and writing and mathematical skills required for entry into these occupations are equal to or higher than what is required for entry into college. And um, there is a big public perception that these could be a plan B for kids that can't make plan A of university. And that's just not the reality of the workplace needs that we have. Um, I will say a few things that we've done. Um, in the past, I used to be our technical training manager for Generation and Gulf Power Company, responsible for the technical training for engineers and craft and technical skill sets in our power plants. And over the years, as we are focusing on cost of product to customer and bringing that cost down, we have diminished training budgets at the same time that new hires that we bring into the workplace have increasing needs for additional training to, as Lisa said, be able to hit the ground running or to be able to do something when they come to work. And we have lost because we have closed many of what were traditionally known as our VOTEC programs in schools. So many of them have been closed. Um, we have lost a lot of those basic mechanical aptitudes that students only gain through exposure to certain things. And so early on, we knew that we needed to get involved kind of further upstream in the talent supply process. And in 2001, we opened our first four-year high school career academy called the Gulf Power Academy. We now have 53 employees at Gulf Power who graduated from there and either came to work with us right out of high school or after a two-year degree. And we have one now who's an engineering co-op with us about to finish his electrical engineering degree as well. I do think there's a way for students to both graduate high school with certifications and experience in industry already under their belt. There are a lot of models for that out there. And in the energy industry, we certainly have those. In 2006, we formed a statewide consortium of electric utilities. Maureen Wilt from FPL is here. FPL is one of our key partners, as are other um, investor-owned utilities and municipalities and co-ops throughout the state. The Florida Energy Workforce Consortium, we work together as an industry to impact education policy at a state level. And right, I mean, we added a career cluster in Florida. How many of you know that there are 16 career clusters in the United States? Well, in Florida, I know you know that, Frank. Um, but not in Florida. In Florida, we have 17. Um, our great partners at the Florida Department of Education responded to our industry's needs and added a 17th cluster of energy. What that lets us do as an industry is get in the weeds. We get to write the curriculum frameworks. Our technical trainers write the standards that will be taught in both K through 12 tech centers and state colleges in producing folks who are interested in an energy career. That's a great partnership that we're able to have. We also started, by the way, a national organization at the same time, the Center for Energy Workforce Development. We've not been able to move that model through in other states. Um, we did have the first state consortia here, and we do now have those in 43 other states. But right now, we are still the leading state in terms of energy uh, education being shifted toward the needs of the marketplace. We have helped Georgia. They've now adopted a 17th cluster as well. I'm working with California and Mississippi and Indiana. They're trying to do so. But in many other states, though it may be slow here, I got to say, I'll take Florida any day over other states. <laughs> and the ability of education to turn their ear toward what industry needs. Yes, we need more of that. Yes, we need to have move faster. And the last thing I'll say is, yes, it has to be for all students, not just for students that are fortunate within the 15% that are fortunate to participate in our career academies today or in our career and technical education programs in the state of Florida, but for all students. STEM education can't be just for those that are college bound. It has to be for all students. Um, so I'm very um, interested in helping move the conversation to a both and proposition for all students instead of an either or. It is not college or career, it is college and career. And we can't use our old mindset of high school, college, work, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so we really have to help both folks in that pipeline that our educators, administrators understand that shifting change in the workplace and really help our students understand that what made their parents successful or what their parents think will make them successful may not be exactly what the best course is for them and that there's a lot more information that they need to make those important decisions about their future. Thank you.